Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. About thirty years ago, a geologist named Edward Cotter, that's C O T T E R,、uh, published a paper that contained a very interesting hypothesis. He was studying ancient rivers in a North American mountain chain, and he noticed that about four hundred fifty million years ago, rivers started to behave differently. Before then, rivers were wide, shallow, and straight. But after that time, they became deeper and had more curves. They became increasingly meandering, and that's actually how rivers behave to this day. So, why might this change have happened? Maybe there was some kind of climate shift. Well, lots of climate shifts have happened since then. Was the change worldwide or just in that geographical area? Well, Cotter speculated that rivers changed worldwide. But he couldn't prove it because he only had evidence from the one North American mountain chain. But his studies gave him an idea about why rivers started to change. He hypothesized it had to do with the spread of plant life on Earth. So there was no plant life before 450 million years ago. Very little, according to fossil records. Anyway, geologists were intrigued by this hypothesis, which claims that as plants evolved and spread, they had an effect on the terrain and rivers. In the past thirty years, more studies have been done, and now we have a lot of data about river systems from around 450 million years ago from all over the world. In a recent study, a couple of researchers gathered together the existing data. And combined them with their own new field data to get a comprehensive picture of the situation. Their study was specifically designed to identify changes in the shapes of rivers during the time period when vegetation was evolving. And when the researchers compared the data about river shapes with data they had collected about plant life from the same period, the data seemed to prove Cotter's hypothesis. Okay, but how did plant life affect rivers? Well. In order to answer that question, we need to look at the geological evidence. You see, as rivers flow, they leave layers of sediment behind that eventually fossilize. The content, thickness, and shape of these fossilized layers and rocks give us information about how rivers flowed. The earliest records from 500 million years ago show that the sediment in river deposits was largely composed of coarse grains of sand and gravel. That tells us that rivers weren't defined; they were very shallow and wide, almost like floods. But around the time of the rise of plant life, the content of those sediment layers began to change. The coarse grains became much finer, and we see evidence of mud. This suggests that plants promoted the preservation of mud when they sent their roots into the ground. The roots helped to reinforce the ground. Which in turn allowed for the creation of river banks, and we also see evidence of a process called lateral accretion. Lateral accretion happens when water flows around a curve, a bend in a riverbed. Now, the speed of the flow on the outside of the bend is fastest and slowest on the inside of the bend. This sets up what's called a secondary flow across the river bottom. The fast-flowing water on the outside of the bend digs out material from the riverbank and pushes this material laterally across the bottom, and it gets deposited on the other side of the river, on the inner side of the bend. So, when we see in the sediment layers evidence of lateral accretion, erosion on one side and deposits on the other, that's an indicator that a meandering river existed. And according to the study. Strong evidence of lateral accretion appears in the geological record. At the same time, there's also evidence of plants with underground root systems. This suggests that plants promoted the development of modern rivers by creating stable banks, which resulted in the flow of water in single meandering channels. So it looks like the researchers were able to prove the hypothesis. Well, there's no denying that the study presents a very strong case, but some questions about this hypothesis remain. For example, it's well known that on other planets like Mars, there's clear evidence of meandering rivers. But is there evidence of vegetation on Mars? 
I think not. What does the professor mainly discuss? Example, it's well known that on other planets, like Mars, there's clear evidence of meandering rivers. But is there evidence of vegetation on Mars? I think not. Listen to part of a lecture in a meteorology class. Okay, it's important to measure a hurricane's intensity before it reaches land because it can help save lives and avoid the enormous costs of an unnecessary evacuation. But the factors leading to a hurricane's intensity, like wind speed, is very tricky to measure because they're changing constantly. So can anyone tell me how we get information about the intensity of a hurricane that's on the way? Jennifer. Well, don't we, like, fly planes into it? Right. Planes that monitor hurricanes fly through the eye of a hurricane to measure the speed of the storm's wind. But it's very expensive and brings a lot of risks. I understand the point about it being risky for the pilots with the high winds and lightning and everything. But, um, how can it be so expensive? Well, you see, hurricane monitoring planes are built to withstand strong winds and they're usually loaded with a lot of sophisticated equipment that will measure wind speed and other things. One plane costs about $100 million, and its single flight costs like $50,000. Plus, it can take as many as 10 flights to monitor a hurricane as it approaches land. From the readings of these direct measurements of hurricane force, we can determine whether to evacuate the area. But that's an expensive approach. I mean, we can't simply fly planes into every hurricane and cyclone. Now, a couple of researchers think that there may be a better way to measure a hurricane's intensity, uh, a much more cost-effective way. It has almost no risks and requires much lower tech equipment, so this method is very promising. It's a microphone, an underwater microphone called a hydrophone. Okay, so how it works is um, it receives acoustic waves underwater. 
By measuring the noise of a hurricane underwater, we can predict the speed of hurricane winds with an amazing precision. Yes, John. But how can we hear winds blowing over the water if the microphone, the hydrophone, is underwater? Well, hurricanes don't just blow over the water leaving it untouched, do they? Oh yeah, the water gets churned up. Hurricanes churn up the waves like crazy. The roiling action of the wind actually turns the water into a bubble-filled froth. And all this action creates a unique rumbling sound under the water, whose volume is a good indicator of the intensity of the storm, the uh, speed of the hurricane winds. Uh, hydrophones can be deployed hundreds of meters below the surface ahead of the hurricane's path while conditions are still safe. Also, the total cost for such a deployment would be a small fraction of the cost of even a single flight into the storm. I wonder how they figure this out. I mean, how would it occur to anyone to put a microphone underwater to measure the speed of the hurricane winds? Well, this actually brings us back to something I've talked about in class before. It's the uh, value of combining scientific disciplines to deal with complex meteorological problems. In this case, the idea came to light when two researchers from different fields met a few years ago. One was Nicholas Macris, an expert of underwater acoustics, and the other was Carrie Emanuel, a hurricane expert. So, uh, well, the research was triggered by their conversation. Emanuel asked Macris, is it possible that underwater noise could be analyzed to determine the intensity of a hurricane? Macris said, yes, in theory at least. It was a commonly known fact that wind speed has something to do with underwater noise. But it was not until Macris met Emmanuel that the idea occurred to him to use that relationship to measure hurricane winds. So, Macris started looking for specific evidence to support the theory. He thought there may have been a situation where a hydrophone was deployed for some other purpose and unintentionally recorded hurricane noise. And he found it. In 1999, a hydrophone in the middle of the Atlantic, just under a kilometer below the surface, was listening for underwater earthquakes when a hurricane passed over it. The hydrophone picked up a low rumbling sound, like the thundering sound, from the churned up water. And on the same day, a plane had flown into the hurricane and made direct wind speed measurements. When Macris compared the data, he found that there was almost a perfect relationship between the power of the wind and the power of the wind-generated noise and there was less than 5% of error, which is about the same as the errors you get from direct measurements from airplane measurements. Number one, what is the main purpose of the discussion? Number two, according to the professor, what is one benefit of hurricane monitoring airplanes? Number three, what are two advantages of using a hydrophone to measure hurricane intensity? Click on two answers. Number four, what does the professor imply about the relationship between the two researchers he mentions? Number five. Why does the professor mention a hydrophone listening for underwater earthquakes?
Number six. Listen again to part of the discussion, then answer the question. But how can we hear winds blowing over the water if the microphone, the hydrophone, is underwater? Well, hurricanes don't just blow over the water, leaving it untouched, do they? Why does the professor say this? Hurricanes don't just blow over the water, leaving it untouched, do they? Listen to part of a music appreciation class. What I really want from you guys is that you learn how music can affect our feelings, really grasping the essence of music. Actually, you already knew music has an influence on humans' feeling in many ways before ever coming to this class. However, I'd like focus on how to do this today. Actually, it's the thing about humans: music is universal form and has been so in every human civilization since the beginning of time. It's like we're hardwired to appreciate music. Okay, when we hear music, it stimulates some areas of our brain. In addition to this, when we hear a low-frequency sound transforming to a high-frequency sound, it actually makes our brain react in a certain way. So, this is what I want to talk to you about today: a research done on the relationship between music and the brain. This research involved positron emission tomography, or PET scan. This is a kind of scan that can project three-dimensional images of the internal organs, and can even detect and display the areas in the brain that are being stimulated. Here's one experiment. Researchers asked subjects to listen to music, and they used the PET scan to detect what areas in the brain were being stimulated. Well, so what did they find out? One region is very obvious: the area of the brain devoted to audio stimulation. I mean, it's music, right? But the thing that was really amazing was that another area of the brain lit up. It's the part that handles visual information. This was definitely something that the researchers had not anticipated. Now, if you think about it, it's really amazing that the visual area lit up because of audio stimulation. Specifically, the areas that lit up are called Brodmann areas 18 and 19, known as the mind's eye. There is a visual cortex in each hemisphere of the brain. The left hemisphere visual cortex receives signals from the right visual field, and vice versa. These areas, like a mental canvas. So when you listen to music, your mind tries to symbolize an image to go well with that sound. These two areas are in the outer layers of the cerebral cortex. All right. Another remarkable outcome of the experiment was that music even activated not only the cerebral cortex but also areas deep in the brain. They are called the limbic system. The limbic system is a deep primal area of the brain that has to do with memory and emotion. And if you think about it. That makes sense too. I mean, even myself. When I listen to a song that I loved as a child, I'm instantly transferred back to the feelings that I had at that time. Much in the same way, if you listen to fast, upbeat music, you'll tend to feel a little happier. Therefore, music is closely connected to both visual images and emotions. So people have tried to make good sounds or music since ancient times. Okay. Now let's take a look at how people made sounds. I mean, music. Apparently, music has been important to people since a very, very long time ago. In fact, the oldest known instrument, a type of flute, is dated to be thirty to forty thousand years old. That predates agriculture. Was music more important than food? Anyway,、uh, let's see. Thirty-one broken pieces of a mammoth tusk were found in Germany by a team of archaeologists. After they put the pieces together, the completed instrument was 11 centimeters long and had three finger holes in it. It looks like a modern-day flute. Experts have concluded that it was capable of producing a very broad range of complex sounds. Now let's talk about the flute in more detail. I mean, about making it. It would take such a long time to obtain a mammoth tusk, hollow it out, cut it perfectly in half, and drill holes into it. Then putting the two halves back together again and making an airtight seal. Oh, and that would have been done with stone tools. Can you imagine the amount of time? You really have to marvel at the amount of work that it must have involved. Okay, so it's obvious that music must have been important. But why? Why was music important? Well, there are some researchers out there that believe music is just something that tickles certain areas of our brain. 
But I think music is much more than that. First, in ancient civilizations, hunters, for example, could have sung and danced together to coordinate attack strategies during combats. Uh, there is one more example. In those ancient societies, when mothers carrying babies would go out and look for berries, the mother would have to put her baby down to gather them, right? Well, the mother could have sung to the baby to let the baby know she was still there. As a result, music connected people then and still does now. This is also true with modern music, including rock and roll, the blues, jazz, and hip hop. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number one What is the main topic of the lecture? Number 2. According to the professor, what was an unexpected outcome of the PET scan? Number 3. What things does the limbic system affect? Click on two answers. Number 4. Why does the professor mention a flute? Number 5. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. It would take such a long time to obtain a mammoth tusk, hollow it out, cut it perfectly in half, and drill holes into it. Then, putting the two halves back together again and making an airtight seal. Oh, and that would have been done with stone tools. Can you imagine the amount of time? Why does the professor say this? Can you imagine the amount of time? Number 6. According to the professor, why would ancient hunters have sung together? Listen to part of a lecture in a music history class. Okay, we're going to continue our discussion of 20th century music. In the early 20th century, some composers in Europe and the United States, composers of so-called classical music, had already started abandoning traditional forms um, in favor of newer and different ways. They were exploring new types of making music, as the century progressed, though, the styles of avant-garde composers began to take further shape. People didn't always appreciate new styles of music being experimented. It was actually the other way around. You see, for many people, avant-garde music was too radical and difficult. They even thought the government should put a ban on it. Now, as a case in point, let's look at the composer John Cage. Cage is among the most famous composers of 20th century avant-garde music. His earliest compositions were written in a traditional style, 
But then he quickly moved on to create unique kinds of works. So what caused him to change? He had two particular experiences that entirely changed how we thought about music. One was when he met the avant-garde painter Robert Rosenberg in 1951. Now, what does painting have anything to do with making music? Well, avant-garde is a term that applies to a lot of artistic genres. The famous painter, Rauschenberg, had created a series of famous paintings that were composed mainly of white paint. There was basically nothing on his paintings, just different textures of white. I mean, literally, just white. However, the concept behind these paintings actually wasn't so simple. He was trying to show that even if you don't create any artwork, you can still have something, because even on a purely white canvas, there's still plenty to see. Shadows, reflections, dust. Rosenberg's white painting was highly influential for Cage and opened up a whole new way of understanding what art could be. The other important experience in Cage's development came when he stepped into an anechoic chamber of Harvard University. Now, an anechoic chamber is a room with walls that are designed to absorb all sounds made in the room. The word anechoic means totally silent, so this is an ideal place where you can experience absolute silence. When Cage entered the room, he heard two unexpected sounds. One high, his nervous system in operation. One low, his blood in circulation. He was deeply affected. It was at this point that he realized that music doesn't need to be created intentionally. It is already all around us. This idea is what came to be called found sound. Basically, it's the sounds that are already there. Traffic outside your windows, raindrops, or whatever. Cage thought that they were just as musical as sounds made by musical instruments. It was these experiences that led Cage to create a composition that would express the idea of found sound. He wanted to provide an opportunity for the audience to identify random and natural sounds of the environment as music. So he composed his most famous piece called 4 Minutes 33 Seconds, commonly known as the silent composition. This piece was completely silent. It consisted of the pianist going up to the piano and not hitting any keys for 4 minutes and 33 seconds. In other words, the entire piece consisted of silence. The only thing the pianist did was raise and lower the lid of the keyboard to let the audience know the beginning and ending of a movement. This composition had three movements, but not a single note was played in any of them. Well, when it was first performed on stage, the audience was furious. People began whispering to one another, and some people began to walk out. It was called ridiculous and crazy by critics. For Cage, though, the music was just fine. He said that the audience was scandalized because they just missed the whole point of his music. He believed that there was no such thing as silence, no such thing as a complete absence of sound. During the performance, in fact, there were sounds of the wind in trees, raindrops pattering on the roof, and people muttering. Cage had a different understanding of silence. He defined silence as simply the absence of intended sound, or rather, turning off our awareness. If we give up intention, then we hear silence. So, to understand 4 minutes 33 seconds as music, the audience had to pay close attention to the sound around it. Well, this was quite revolutionary, so the reactions of people at the time were pretty much legitimate. I mean, it's confusing and even confounding to people even today. Cage's silence composition is still performed all over the world. Unfortunately, though, I guess it's often misinterpreted. You see, it's been choreographed, so sometimes it includes dance performances with the beat of the dancer's feet against the stage floor. And they make some noises on purpose to call attention to the fact the piece is basically silent. Now, do you think these performances reflect Cage's ideas well?
Number 1. What is the lecture mainly about? Number 2. According to the professor, how did Rauschenberg's white paintings influence John Cage? Number 3. Why was the experience of visiting an anechoic chamber significant for Cage? Number 4. What was Cage's attitude toward found sound? Number 5. What does the professor imply when he discusses the audience at the first performance of 4 minutes 33 seconds? Number 6. Why does the professor think that many of today's performances of 4 minutes 33 seconds are misinterpreted?